You're listening to episode eight of A Whole New You podcast. On today's show, we'll discuss why it's so important to eat real food, and we'll give you tips and tricks on how to do that. Welcome to A Whole New You podcast. I'm your co-host, Kim Maravich. I'm a registered nurse and author of the book, 360 Health. I'm joined by my dear friend, Lori Biddle, a health and wellness coach certified through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Our show exists to inspire and empower women to take charge of their health with weekly tips and conversation about self-care, mindset, nutrition, fitness, and clean living. Please keep in mind that the material provided in this podcast is intended as general information only and should not be used as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We're thrilled to have you here. Let's get to the show. Hi guys, Kim and I are here today in our recording studio, aka my kitchen, and it is January, there's snow on the ground, and the sun is shining, I love that combination. Earlier today, I thought we actually might need some sunglasses sitting at this table, but the sun shifted a little bit, and um, you know, it's not right in our faces, but we are just getting some of that nice warm yumminess, which is great. And both Kim and I had a little bit of a challenging week this week. You know, there's some stuff going on in our households with our families. And you all know as, you know, mothers and wives, when something's going on with your kids or husband, you know, we just feel it so deeply. So Kim and I have definitely both had one of those weeks. So in addition to the sunshine on our face this morning here as we record, we also have some geranium oil going in the diffuser. And I'm just going to take a second and read a little something about geranium oil. And it is help, it helps release negative memories and take a person back to a peaceful, joyful moment. It may also help ease some nervous tension and stress, balance the emotions, lift the spirit, and foster peace, well-being, and hope. Ah, isn't that what we both need? <laughs> yes, we really do. <laughs> it's been a tough week. And you've all been there, too. You get it. You know what it's like to have families and personal stresses. So Lori's taking care of us. And we're both really excited to be here today because the topic is something we're both very passionate about. And so we're actually recording on a Friday this week. So this is a great way to wrap up a rough week, talking about something we love and, you know, um, Last episode, we talked about all the different diets out there, and there's so many. You know, you've got vegetarian, vegan, keto, paleo. Our society just loves to put a label on things, and it can get really confusing, and there's a lot of contradiction between the different plans. So if you felt a little overwhelmed with the last episode, you are going to love this one today. And Kim and I, like I said, are super excited to talk about it because we're going to take it back to basics and talk about real food. This is one of the very first things that I work on with my health coaching clients, because food is so powerful. It can either fight or feed disease. And Kim's going to talk to us more specifically about why this is true. So when we talk about real foods, um, just, you know, as a, a quick definition, we're talking about and referring to unprocessed foods primarily. Um, so we're talking about things that are really not coming out of a box or a bag or a package. And we're also going to be talking about some higher quality kinds of foods. So what I'm going to do right now is just kind of go through categories of foods and talk to you not only, um, about what these real foods are, but why they are important. Because I think sometimes we think, oh, we know we need to eat fruits and vegetables, but we're not a hundred percent sure why certain kinds of foods are important. So what I'm going to do first is talk about the category of anti-angiogenic foods. And I'm leading off with that category because it's probably one you may or may not have heard about. Um, It is the focus of the nutrition part of my book that I wrote, 360 Health. Um, The book is all about cancer prevention. And what angiogenesis is is the formation of abnormal blood cells or blood vessels, excuse me, that go to cancerous tumors. So when someone has cancer, they develop these abnormal blood blood vessels that feed the cancer cells and which can also result in metastasis of of the cancer. So eating anti-angiogenic foods 
has been shown in lab studies to uh, reduce the incidence of angiogenesis. Of, um, so these foods can help stop the blood flow to cancerous tumors, which is really groundbreaking information. Um, there's a lot more information in my book, and we are going to be talking about my book in future episodes. So I'm not going to go into great detail about that. But um, there is um, an angiogenesis foundation. Dr. William Lee is the head of that. And he has come up with a list of foods that can help prevent um, cancer. So some of those are fruits like red grapes, strawberries, berries, cherries, apples, veggies like kale, beets, artichokes, tomatoes, garlic, mushrooms, soybeans, spices like turmeric or turmeric. How do you say it, Laurie? Turmeric. I say turmeric, turmeric. Turmeric, I think I usually say, but I hear people say turmeric. Everyone pronounces it differently, so I probably pronounce it differently every time I say it, too. <laughs> I know, me too. Uh, so however you want to say it, um, but that's a big one. We talked about supplementing with that before. Cinnamon, licorice, drinks like green tea and red wine, oils like olive oil, grapeseed oil, seafood like tuna, and something called uh, sea cucumbers, which I had never heard of uh, prior to writing the book, but... I, I think you can find them in Asian markets. I've never tried them, but um, they are anti-angiogenic and also dark chocolate. So there's some good ones Yay! on that list. <laughs> I know. Well, that's my favorite, too. Um, so again, we'll, we'll go into more detail in future episodes, um, and it's also available in my book. But those foods um, are great to get in your diet because of the benefits that it could have for disease prevention. And also, before we go into other categories... I want to talk about why eating organic and non-GMO when possible is really important. Um, GMO foods have been, have been shown to um, be associated with nervous system disorders, organ damage, allergies, even cancer, uh, behavioral issues. Um, there was a study in, that was published in Environmental Sciences Europe that saw a connection between GMO foods and organ damage, and also second-generation breast cancer in female rats, which meant that um, a second generation would be that the, your offspring is also affected by what you eat. So what you're eating, if you're you know, a woman who is thinking about um, conceiving, uh, it's important that what you eat now before you have the baby, um, that you focus on that because what we do, what we eat is passed along to our children. Um, so what are GMO foods? Well, um, we know that they are, they're genetically modified. They're often um, very heavily sprayed with chemicals. The four most common GMO foods are corn, soy, canola, and cotton. And I always joke about the cotton because uh, we don't really eat cotton. However, uh, you're going to see in some bakeries, uh, if you go to, you know, if you're buying cupcakes or cakes and you look on the label, sometimes it'll say cottonseed oil, uh, which to me is just kind of gross because, you know, like I said, we don't eat cotton, but just because you can make an oil out of something doesn't mean that it should be edible. So those four, you definitely want to buy in their organic form to make sure you're not eating GMO foods. Organic is also important because pesticides are created expressly to kill living organisms. Okay, so they're supposed to kill things like insects and fungi that are considered to be pests, but many of the pesticides do pose health dangers to people um, like brain and nervous system toxicity, cancer, and hormone disruption. Um, so we know that you can't completely eat organic all the time, so what you want to think about when you go shopping at the grocery store is at least looking um, to stay away from conventional list or conventional foods on the list of the dirty dozen. The Environmental Working Group puts out this list every year, and they update it every year. And I will list for you the most recent foods on the dirty dozen list, and these are the ones that you want to buy in their organic form when possible. So strawberries is one. And Lori and I were talking before the show that this is such a common, commonly consumed food, and it can be really hard to find organic strawberries in the grocery store, um, especially like in the wintertime. In the summertime, you might have um, more options, but they also tend to be expensive. 
So one thing you can look for are frozen strawberries. Um, they're great in smoothies, or you can set them out and let them thaw. You can macerate them and, you know, top some, you know, coconut uh, ice cream with them or mm. just make little desserts. Um, but or, buying those organic is really important. Another one is spinach. That's a very, very heavily consumed food, but it is laden with pesticides um, if, if it's not bought in the organic form. Others on the list or the dirty dozen are nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, potatoes, and sweet bell peppers. So a lot of those, again, are very commonly consumed foods, but they are the worst as far as um, being laden with uh, pesticides. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. You know, I was just thinking, Kim, as you were saying potatoes, I think back to um, a workshop I did last year. I think you came. Yes, you were there too, Kim, um, called Eat Real Food. And we had a farmer, a local organic farmer, come and speak. And, you know, he was saying how it's surprising that potatoes are on the Dirty Dozen list because, you know, they're under the ground. They're not getting sprayed with pesticides and whatnot. But, uh, you know, his thought on that was more about how they're stored after they're pulled from the ground, um, that there's some chemicals and stuff used in that process. And so that's kind of what's bringing them on the dirty dozen list. I just thought that was an interesting perspective because you don't think a lot of times that, you know, that our root vegetables and the things that are grown down in the ground um, mm -hmm. are being sprayed or, you know. Yeah, that is that is interesting. He was, he was great. Um, mm -hmm. He also was quick to point out that there are pesticides that are, um, you know, organic farmers use um, because basically it's just it's just to keep away you know insects. But there are there are pesticides that, that are used even in organic farms um, that are useful in in helping the plant thrive, but aren't potentially dangerous to us. Yeah. So he said the key word, and you know, I guess we kind of give pesticides a bad name when we keep throwing that out there. But he said synthetic pesticides mm, yeah. are what we need to be looking out for. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I like what Lori said about the potatoes. That's true. He, did, he talked about the, them being sprayed. Um, a lot of these other um, fruits and vegetables that I talked about, though, I, I want to make it clear. Um, I think a lot of times people think, well, if I just wash these, I'm washing the pesticides off. But that really is not the case um, because the pesticides are, are becoming part of the fruit, part of the vegetable, part of the plant um, when they're being sprayed while the plant is growing. So it's inherently inside of it. You can't wash them away. Um, now, if it's a spray over crop, then yes, that's different. But more than likely, a lot of these on the list, the pesticides are already inside it and you, and you can't, you can't get rid of them. So what do we, what are some that are safe all the time? Well, the environmental working group also puts out a clean 15 list. And the, the foods on this list, you know you can buy in their conventional form. There is no need to buy them in organic form. You're, in fact, you could just be, you know, wasting money on those because you, there's no harm in eating those in the conventional form. So the foods on that list are avocado, sweet corn, pineapples, cabbage, onion, sweet peas. And it, they, had, they said frozen in parentheses, so I'm not sure, you know, what the difference is with that. But you can know that, you know, those are clean papaya, asparagus, mango, eggplant, honeydew, kiwi, cantaloupe, cauliflower, and broccoli. Um, so again, you can save money by just buying those in their conventional form and not worrying about buying those organic. So now I'm going to get, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lori. Yeah. I was just thinking about corn, you know, with sweet corn being on that list and going back to what Kim was just talking about with the um, GMO foods, corn a lot of times is a really highly GMO, you know, modified crop. Mm -hmm. So even though corn's on the clean list, a lot of times, especially when it comes to corn chips um, or, you know, like frozen corn, you can find organic in the, in the frozen section and, you know, the organic corn chips because, you know, not that they're high in pesticides, which is what these are really looking at, and that's what they're testing for, you know, for these particular lists is the high pesticide counts. But those, you know, are something that is very genetically modified. And um, so sometimes I do, I buy the organic version and corn for that reason. 
I'm glad you said that because I, I didn't make that connection until just now. Yeah. But sometimes, even if it's not organic, it'll have that non-GMO yes. seal on there. So you want to look for that. It doesn't necessarily have to be or certified organic to be non-GMO. That's a really good point. Um, and I agree. I, I always buy organic corn. I, you know, I, I do buy the frozen organic corn. I buy organic tortilla chips. Um, and yes, that's one thing. If you are buying anything that, if it's coming from a package, like for example, the tortilla chips, looking for a non-GMO seal is, is good. And that's, that's one of the positive things our government is, is working towards, um, as far as our food supply goes. Um, having labels like that makes it a much easier decision when you're, when you're grocery shopping. So yeah, thank you for that, Lori. Okay, now I'm going to get into a couple different categories of foods and just explaining, you know, why these foods are important um, as far as, you know, your health, what benefits they have for your health. So fruits, we know, are all really high in antioxidants. And vitamin C especially is helpful for boosting immunity. So think about foods like your citrus fruits that you, you know, that you would think about with vitamin C, but also apricots and cantaloupe, guava and kiwi. Those are all on the list. So you really can't go wrong with um, many, many fruits. Sometimes, you know, if you have blood sugar imbalances, you'll need to look for, you know, and stay away from high sugar foods like um, bananas and uh, mango, papaya. But in general, fruits, you're not going to go wrong eating any kind of fruit. As far as vegetables go, dark leafy greens we know are really important because they contain folate. Um, phytonutrients, and also chlorophyll. And chlorophyll, you know, gives it the green color. Um, Chlorophyll helps to bind with carcinogens and even some heavy metals um, so that they can be eliminated from your body. So that's really a win-win. And also they're filled with fiber. So we're talking about things, um, we talked about kale and spinach earlier, but also Swiss chard, collard greens, romaine. Um, And then also in vegetables, cruciferous vegetables are important. And for those, kale actually falls into that category, but as does broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. And again, for these, I'm not listing every single uh, food, but just more explaining the category and why it's important. The cruciferous vegetables contain fiber, folate, lots of vitamins, and also sulfur, um, and which is interesting. Sulfur is important for detoxification. And it helps to produce glutathione, which we talked about in other episodes. The glutathione is our master antioxidant, which our bodies make. So these these fruit or these vegetables help to produce glutathione in our body. The sulfur can also help the skin activate brain cells and even decrease LDL cholesterol. Um, one thing I did note that is that steaming broccoli and cauliflower actually helps to release more of the antioxidants. You know, it's not a bad thing to eat it raw because uh, because of the fiber and the way that it does act like a scrub brush through your, you know, intestines to help you um, with elimination. But if you want to get the most bang for your buck, you could also um, steam them, and then that makes it a little bit easier to to eat and maybe even eat more of them. Um, other sulfur-rich vegetables are onions, leeks, garlics, garlic, and shallots. Orange veggies are important um, because, like you know, so I'm thinking about um, orange bell peppers. And carrots, they contain beta carotene, which is a powerful antioxidant and a precursor to vitamin A, and they can help to boost the immune system. The next category are nuts. Um, Nuts provide mono and polyunsaturated fats, omega-3s, fiber, and vitamin E. Um, I have a a bunch of studies listed in my book on why um, nuts can be beneficial, Um, but Suffice it to say that the more nuts consumed um, over and over again in studies showed that it could help reduce your risk of death from cancer. Um, And that's just because of all of those anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. They also contain phytosterols, which help to reduce cholesterol too. One thing you want to look and stay away from are um, nuts that are doused in oils, especially, you know, uh, canola oils, for example, Um, because those are damaged. So eating them raw or even dry roasted um, would be a lot better for you. Seeds are are the next category, and similar to nuts, they they are filled with omega-3s, fiber, um, and antioxidants. Flax seeds specifically contain lignans, which are 
phytoestrogens, um, they have anti-cancer activity um, in the breast, which is interesting. Other seeds to look for that you want to include are chia, hemp, sunflower, um, and sprouts even. Legumes are another category, and when I think of legumes, I'm typically thinking of beans. So um, we're talking here about things like kidney beans, black beans, split peas, and lentils. Um, now, the one thing is that they can cause bloating, um, so you can you know limit your uh, intake of, of beans. We don't want to be having a <laughs> embarrassing problems happening. You know the song, beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I love that. I know. I actually was like thinking in my head, I made lentil soup last night, and my husband looked at it, and he was like, um, <laughs> okay. He has some issues sometimes with beans, so uh, he actually popped a bean out. I don't even know if that's a great thing or not, but it helps him anyway. But um, And you. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, it helps me too. <laughs> right. But if you do cook them um, and soak beans ahead of time, it helps to um, take away those um, excess bloating-causing um, properties. So um, we often call these pulses, and they are filled with protein, fiber, folate, phytochemicals, and resistant starches also. Um, so it, they are good for your gut. You know. So again, and it, if you can't tolerate a lot, take them in smaller doses, but they help with that beneficial bacteria. And moving on to resistant starches, that is another category I had listed. Um, again, this they promote the growth of good bacteria in our gut and also promote a lower pH in our body. So we're talking about things in addition to um, you know the legumes. We're talking about things like green bananas and plantains, oats, cooked and cooled potatoes, which is interesting because there's something about and I think you may have heard of that too. And also um, cooked and, and cooled forms of pasta, for some reason, after you cook them and then put them in the refrigerator, they contain more of the resistant starch. So, um, and you can heat them up again, but it's okay to, you know, you know, boil some potatoes and put them in the fridge and then, you know, eat them, you know, with your lunch or even top them on a salad um, because they help to form those resistant starches. Um, other foods in the category are sweet potatoes, tapioca, and potato starch. You might see that in um, some packaged um foods. Another food that kind of fits in that category are fermented foods. And again, I'm, I'm talking about because of the benefits with the gut. We know that 70% of our immune system is in the gut. And so it's important to include these in our diet um, to help boost our immunity. So we're talking about um, yogurt. Um, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, but grass fed would be the best and organic, of course, for for yogurt um, and dairy products. So organic, kefir, um, some people refer to it as kefir. I always say kefir. I say kefir too. I'm yeah. glad you do too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I never know. But um, kombucha, kimchi, we, last week, or no, it wasn't last week. It was a, a few episodes back. I just listened to the episode. But um, sauerkraut and pickles, we talked about in, in past episodes, how um, the fermented and forms of those um, are really good for you. Um, next, we have seafood. Seafood is rich in omega-3s. They're very anti-inflammatory. Um, the seafood that you, wanna, you want to look for are not so much like the bigger forms of seafood, like, um, you know, like swordfish or some people even eat shark, but things like salmon, herring, trout, mackerel, sardines, a lot of those are smaller. We know that they don't contain as much mercury. Um, and again, you're going you're gonna to want to look for wild-caught salmon, Salmon especially has astaxanthin, which gives it its kind of um, pinkish-reddish color. Um, it's an antioxidant, and it's also been shown to be cancer-protective. As far as your meat sources go, we, you want to be looking for the purest forms possible. So um, we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, but this is where you're, you want to put your money when you're grocery shopping. Um, I, I think even above and beyond some organic produce, if you're eating meat, you want to make sure they're the highest quality. So grass-fed beef is really important because the cattle, we know, are eating what nature intended them to eat. The cow stomachs are designed to eat grass, and when they're given things like grain and especially 
um, grain that is genetically modified and non-organic, it makes the animal sick, which is why they're given antibiotics. And so if we're eating um, a non-grass-fed source of beef, for example, we're ingesting those antibiotics too. And also, if it's not organic um, or non-grass-fed, then likely the animal has also been given hormones to help plump them up and um, assist with the growth of the animal. But we don't want exogenous hormones coming into our bodies because of all the hormone-disrupting things that they can do, including cancer. So if we think about hormone-disrupting cancers, we're thinking about breast and ovarian and uterine and prostate in men. So we want to try to stick with grass-fed beef. And also, it's more nutrient-dense. It conta- contains conjugated linoleic acid, or CLA, which reduces inflammation and boosts immunity. And uh, it, it also is rich in omega-3s. Lamb is another one that's uh, a, a healthy source. Um, it's rich in B vitamins and also the CLA. Organ meats, uh, we've talked about before, but they're, it's, they're very rich in B vitamins. And also, if you're getting organ meats, you want to get those from grass-fed sources as well. Organ meats also contain zinc and selenium. And bone broth falls under this meat category. We talked in previous episodes about how bone broth has that healing collagen in it and is really good for um, gut health as well. And dairy, again, we're talking about trying to find the best sources of dairy. Organic or grass-fed are the best because of the same reasons we talked about with the meat. We don't want the antibiotics from the animals. We don't want the hormones from from the animals. One caveat I will say is that you have a, if you have a sensitivity to dairy, meaning it causes bloating or um, constipation, digestive issues, skin issues, acne, rosacea, if you have a sensitivity, you don't want to be consuming dairy because it's inflaming your body. So only you, only you know if you tolerate it well, and that's even with organic versions. So if it's causing inflammation, even if it's organic, you want to stay away from it. One... Uh, source of dairy that I looked into for my book, which is pretty interesting, is whey protein. And I'm not talking about the, you know, the chocolatey, um, sugar-laden, artificial sweetener, you know, power-lifting whey proteins that, you know, uh, weightlifters use. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm talking about undenatured, grass-fed, basically unflavored. Um, if If it is flavored, maybe a little stevia or coconut sugar is okay. Um, but that has been shown... It has lactoferrin, and it's been shown to activate the neutrophils and macrophages in your T cells, which are all all help to boost immunity, and it also helps to produce that master antioxidant glutathione. Uh, Moving along to eggs, uh, again, if you can't tolerate them, or if it's a it's a common food sensitivity uh, food or, or trigger. So if you are sensitive, again, you want to stay away from them because just because something is healthy for one person doesn't mean it is for you. But eggs are good because they have antioxidant. Now, we're talking about primarily in the yolk. People, I think, in the past were, you know, oh, I need all egg white omelet um, and, you know, toss out the yolks. The yolk is where all the vitamins are. So you want to eat the yolks. In fact, there is a book by Liz Wolf that's called Eat the Yolks, (laughs) which I recommend. Um, but it contains all the antioxidants. It has choline, which is anti-inflammatory. Um, and the University of North Carolina published a study that showed a 24% reduced risk of developing breast cancer in women with the highest choline levels. So choline is, um, is very good and for cancer prevention. Some beverages to consider coffee, um, which is a yay from me, (laughs) but it contains a lot of antioxidants um, and it has been shown to decrease certain forms of cancer like liver, uh, colorectal, and even melanoma. Teas um, are filled with polyphenols, um, which can block DNA damage. Um, Alcohol, to some extent, um, can be very protective. Um, it actually, because of um, it can fight against H. pylori, which is um, a bacteria in the stomach that can cause stomach ulcers, uh, but can lead to stomach cancer. However, one to three drinks a week is all that's needed for that. But if you don't drink alcohol, it's not to worry. Um, filtered water, we've talked about in extent before, and Lori's going to talk more about hydration coming up. 
apple cider vinegar is one that you can you know mix with hot lemon water um, people do shots of it even but it's antibacterial and antiviral um, two more categories one is fats so when we talk about fats you want to be focusing on the good and healthy fats like olive oil we said was anti-angiogenic um, because it contains something called olecanthal coconut oil is healthy there were some question got lots of questions about a year and a half ago from people um, it is a saturated fat but it's but it's a healthy saturated fat it has lauric acid which supports immunity and is antimicrobial avocados are great they contain carotenoids and also avocado oil is a great one for cooking Processed oils that you should stay away from are ones that are oxidized or damaged, and those are things like canola, soybean, cottonseed, anything with hydrogenated oils, and even fried foods, which is sad because I do like French fries, but they're not great for you. And the last one are sweeteners. You just want to avoid them as much as possible, especially artificial sweeteners, because they do they can, they can wreck your uh, metabolism and also... Um, they, they can um, increase insulin levels um, because your body is, your brain is expecting a, a sugar spike and, it, and calorie spike and it doesn't get that and kind of confuses the brain. But even um, normal sweeteners, um, you want to use them sparingly, but some that I would recommend over just regular sugar is um, honey, maple syrup, stevia, coconut sugar, and even dates. You can use those to, to sweeten foods. Okay, so now that we know all the whys of certain categories of foods, Lori is going to get into the good stuff and tell us how to easily get these into your diet. Yeah, so going back to, you know, all this organic, you guys are probably freaking out thinking, you know, how am I going to afford all this? And, you know, it is definitely a good point, which is why the Environmental Working Group does that list. So you, it can kind of help you prioritize your purchases um, and, you know, just, just changing perspective a little bit. What's that quote, Kim? Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. I mean, that's going way back. You know, our ancestors were very smart. Um, but it is unfortunate that you can buy garbage food for so cheap and you have to spend extra on, you know, the high quality stuff. But, you know, my, my guy that ends up checking me out, I feel like every time I actually go into the grocery store and don't do curbside, <laughs> He, he's, you know, he said to me really early on, oh my goodness, this is, you spend so much or whatever, you know, and, and I looked at him and I said, well, my hope is to spend the money now on this high quality food to keep my family healthy and hopefully save on some medical, you know, costs on the back end. And he was like blown away by that. <laughs> you know, people just don't, no one thinks like that. I think that's probably the IIN influence on me um, that got me got me thinking that way. But boy, it really can, when you're spending the money on high quality food, it can, it can save, you know, a lot of other issues and not just the money with those kind of health problems, you know, in the future, just everything else that comes on with them. So, you know, just, just a little perspective shift there on, on this high quality food. And, you know, next I want to kind of take it back to basics like we're talking about and, you know, last week, we on the last episode, we talked about a bunch of different diets, and it's a lot to think about and a lot to focus on, but I'd like to quiet that noise for a minute and challenge you all to really take a hard look at how many servings of fruits and vegetables you're getting during your day, because it's it's hard to get all those servings in. I get that, even if you're a person that's eating healthy. So take some focus for just a little while off of calories and off of, um, you know, diet categories and, and really just take a hard look at how much of this real food that's coming straight from nature you're actually consuming. Um, so again, I challenge you to, even if you have to write it down, um, just for a few days, just to create some awareness around that. And, you know, what's recommended is like five to 13 servings. 13 servings is like crazy. It's, that's, a, that's hard to get that in. Maybe one day you can do it. But I think doing it on a consistent daily basis can be challenging. But it's also kind of fun once you get started tracking it, seeing, you know, if you, you know, how high you can get on your servings. Um, and the second thing I want you all to just stop and take a look at, and we talk about this all the time, is water. How much water are you consuming a day? 
And, you know, the goal a lot of times is eight by eight, you know, eight glasses, eight ounces. Um, and, and that's why I have my 64 ounce water bottle, which, by the way, my husband stole. So I guess oh. I'm going to have to go out and get myself a new one. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that thing's in high demand these days after everyone made fun of me initially <laughs> for it. Now, you know, it's, uh, it's a good thing. So anyway, by, by really tracking your fruits and veggies and those servings that you're getting a day and tracking your water and focusing really hard on those two things, it really helps to start to crowd out some things like processed foods and refined sugars without even putting the focus on that so much because you're so focused on what you are eating, you're thinking a little less about what you're not eating. So that's kind of a, a good little head game to play with yourself, I guess, but putting the focus you know, in the right place instead of you know, frustrating counting calories and getting on the scale and taking your measurements. And, and not only um, will you benefit from eating all this real food, you'll have more energy. It's like a cycle. You know? you, you're eating well, and then your energy increases, and maybe you can do a workout that you couldn't normally do. You know, So... It has benefits to focus on real food, you know, that, that a lot of the diets have, um, but it's not a diet. And I love that about it. And that's another reason why my, uh, my excitement level goes like through the roof talking about this stuff. Because foods that are close to nature, they give our bodies what they need to thrive. And, you know, unfortunately today, so many of our foods are processed that, you know, so processed that the nutritional value is almost completely removed. So we wonder why we're so tired or our kids are always sick or why we're so moody. You know, real food can keep us healthy. It can give us energy. It can slow down the aging process, ding, 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 <laughs> and improve our mood. So, you know, most of us already know this, but we're not taking full advantage of the power of food. And this is not rocket science, but we're just not doing it. And it's probably because, and I hear this a lot from people, um, you know, it's not convenient. And we don't have time. We have busy lives. We don't have time to be chopping and prepping um, all these fruits and vegetables all the time. And I get that. That is really is a huge, you know, is a huge issue. So today we're going to kind of go into some tips and tricks and some ways to just get some of those servings into yourselves and your kids and get you all feeling great. So I did put this question out, you know, to to our listeners on our social media forums and communities, and I got some some great feedback that I want to share with you all, um, some good tips and tricks, along with a couple challenges that people had. Megan said that she always has fresh fruit like blueberries and organ or organs. <laughs> <laughs> oranges although we did say organ meat's good for you but I think if I slapped a big piece of organ meat on the island for my kids when they came home from school they would not uh, would not be pleased but anyway she has blueberries and or little oranges and apples cleaned and in bowls for when the kids get home from school so they eat the fruit before grabbing the chips that's kind of key too. get them when they're really hungry <laughs> you know um so just kind of being prepared and I love that strategy Megan and then another um Another response was from Carrie. She said with veggies, she, if she washes and cuts them right away when they're bought, they are way more likely to be grabbed. And that is totally true. But I also asked for challenges. So she says here too, you know, uh, to be honest, I don't always make the effort. And I can't tell you how many celery stalks have gone yucky in the drawer as a result. And I, and I kind of threw out there, yeah, you know, that is a challenge, but there's other ways to use some of those veggies too um, as they're getting older, like chopping them up and throwing them in some soup or making a stir fry. And Amy responded too with a, something that I didn't know, said, if your celery isn't too far gone, cut the ends off, stand it up in a glass of water, put it in the fridge, and it'll get crunchy again. Hmm. Huh. I didn't know that either. I know. So thanks, Amy, for that tip. Um, you know, we also got some feedback, too, um, from Alicia mm -hmm. about, you know, real food being a challenge when you go out to eat. And, you know, how she notices that if she brings food home and eats it, you know, over the next few days and not eat those huge portions that are given in a restaurant because she's really been focusing on portions, which is important. Um, you know, that that's helpful in that challenging situation and looking for the more real food options on the menu and not eating the whole serving that they give you. 
Um, and then she also had some advice because Kim had thrown out there, like, it's hard with toddlers. Like, how do you get toddlers to eat all these servings of fruits and vegetables? So I loved what she said about um, having them try a bite of each thing that you make for dinner. If they don't like it, let it be. If they do enjoy it, give them another bite. I wish I would have done this with my kids when they were younger. It would have saved me a ton of stress and screaming over dinner. Amen to that. I know. We all go through it. Although I just think it's kind of a rite of passage for moms. It's Every mother has fought with her kids about eating vegetables. It's just something we have to deal with. But the key is not giving up. I guess, you know, that's... That's the main point here. But, um, you know, she also went on to say making dinner fun can help. You know, let them help cook the meal, and maybe they'll enjoy it a little more. So I loved all that feedback that we got today on tips and tricks. And I'm also going to share with you a couple things that I um, teach workshops on and talk to my clients about. And um, some of these are really super simple things, but I've heard that they were many people's, like, aha moment. Um, so I'm going to go into some of that today for you all. And one of them is a veggie tray. Like, okay, we buy veggie trays for holidays or school events or, you know, whatever. But I have to say my first experience, um, with just randomly buying a veggie tray was when my kids were a little younger and I would cook a vegetable every night and put it on the side of their dinner plate and have a big fight about them eating it and, you know, all the stuff we all go through. And then one day I just bought this veggie tray. It was probably on sale or something, but I brought it home and I plopped it down on the island and they like devoured it. I think it's something about, you know, offering them that variety and letting them choose like one ate all the carrots and one ate all the celery, you know, um, or they ate a little bit of everything instead of just giving them that one vegetable on the side of their plate and saying, eat it, you know, um, it it empowers kids, I think. Um, so that's part of the theory of the vegetable tray. Now you can get a pre-made vegetable tray, um, you know, for convenience sake, or you can buy them like Carrie said and chop them up. And I say, buy a lot of them and chop them up, give them variety and keep it in the fridge all week. So pull it out at every meal, pull it out when they're coming home from school and just have it, you know, con available. That's what makes it convenient. Now, I know the concern that all of you are thinking right now is if they don't eat it, it's going to go to waste. Um, so, you know, a huge thing that, that I do on a weekly basis and recommend for all my clients when you start buying more vegetables is making a stir fry at the end of the week because you can throw anything into stir fry. You know, maybe put a little chicken in there or just leave it like a vegetable stir fry. Um, a nice thing to do with bone broth that we've, we've discussed on a few episodes, all the benefits of bone broth. But sauteing those vegetables that were getting maybe a little yucky in your fridge or you want to make sure you use them because you bought them and you don't want to waste them. So, you know, sauteing them a little bit with some bone broth um, and putting them over some brown rice or something, there's another meal for you, you know, that week. So, you know, they don't have to go to waste and they don't have to be a big project. So those are just some simple little tips. And then the other thing, two words that I love to throw out because it is convenient and it's fast and, um, you know, it's, it's good for you. It's, it's got all those yellow or excuse me, all those orange benefits. So baby carrots. And I know there's some controversy around this one because of maybe the way that baby carrots, your, your conventional baby carrots are handled that they're, I've heard they're bleached and there's some chemicals in them. And so, you know, my workaround on this one is, you know, an organic. I know carrots aren't really on our dirty dozen list, but this is another one that I do always recommend to everybody because you can buy a bag of baby carrots and keep it in your work fridge to munch on. Kids like to munch on them. They're great for lunches. I mean, they are just that convenience factor. And if you're buying organic baby carrots, you don't have to worry. You know, a lot of times with the organic versions, they're using more of a citrus-based something to preserve them, you know, aside, not chemicals. So another thing that I, that I recommend a lot of times is pre-chopped vegetables. If you do not have time to chop those vegetables up to use in meals, a lot of stores do sell pre-already chopped. You know, if it's going to make you eat more fruits and vegetables and it's going to make you toss them in meals, it's worth it. It's worth the convenience because, you know, the alternative is you go to a restaurant, you know, which you're paying for convenience there, too. Um, so my goal is always just finding these shortcuts to get people back in their kitchens. 
And, you know, anytime you're buying the pre-chopped and the baby carrots, those are also times that are good to buy organic so that cause sometimes the pre-chopped fruit or pre-chopped vegetables, you know, they are putting something on there to preserve them. So again, the organic versions will have more of like a citrus base to do that. But it really is going to help you get those servings in and use them in your meals um, because you have them chopped already. Saving minutes is everything. So um, another way, and this is one of my favorite things, I could probably do a whole episode on this, but another way to get lots of fruits and veggies into your day and get those servings in is juice and smoothies. I don't know about you, but you know, eating a salad, I feel like I'm eating and I'm eating and I'm chewing and I'm chewing and it's like not going anywhere. Um, it's like the endless bowl of salad. I don't know. But um, with juice and smoothies, you can pack so much nutrition and so much, um, especially like spinach. Like you can shove a bunch of spinach in your blender or in your juicer and way more, I think, than you could ever eat. Um, but I just want to talk for a minute about the difference between juice and smoothies. I think we've probably mentioned it in previous episodes, but this is you know really interesting and, and good for this topic today. But Juicing is when you are just squeezing the juice from the fruits and vegetables, okay? So you're not getting all that fiber and all of the stuff that is in that whole fruit that you're tossing in the blender for a smoothie. So with the juice, you're, you know, your body's just absorbing all of those nutrients and giving your digestive system a break. So that's the difference with juice. There's a lot of value there smoothies, you toss it all in the blender. You can even mix in like some milk or a banana that makes it a little creamier, which kids usually prefer to juice, to be honest with you. And also back to juicing for a minute, you do want to be a little careful with fruits because you're losing all that good fiber and you're getting, you know, all that sugar that's in fruits. So with juicing, you want to do more vegetables, but a lot of times, especially when it comes to kids, you do need to add a little fruit for that flavor just to sweeten it a little bit. But it's kind of an acquired taste, too. I feel like the more you do it, the more your ratio of vegetables to fruit can change. Um, I, that definitely happened for me. I started more with a little fruit, and, and now I can, I can tolerate and enjoy just a pure vegetable juice. Lori, what, do you, what are your thoughts on um, juicing at home versus buying juices, like either at the store or at one of those um, like juice bars? I know that you uh, right. recently have an affiliation with um, – uh, a local juice company, which I haven't checked out yet, but what are your thoughts about the, the difference between those? Yeah, so, you know, with my experience making these, the smoothies are really convenient at home because you can keep, like, frozen fruit and stuff like that on hand all the time. And I just got a new blender last year that is a one, one of those one-cup deals, and it literally blends for, like, 60 seconds. So, you know, it's, oh, you can pack yogurt in there and fruit and vegetables and chia seeds and flax seeds and, you know, kefir. And there's so many things you can put in a smoothie and have it ready literally in a minute. So I love that about smoothies. Juicing's a whole nother story. Um, I personally love the process because I find it very therapeutic, but it can be a, a lot more work. You know, you, you have to pr prep the vegetables and you, um, I have a slow juicer, which is what you want because it doesn't heat up and kill any nutrients, but it's a slow process. Um, but again, you know, the, the blender is one minute of and the whole kitchen shaking <laughs> and the juicer is like, <laughs> it's just so calming. So totally different experiences, but you know, what I find with my clients and even myself these days, like juicing is not always realistic because it's also a lot of cleanup um, when you're doing it yourself. So this place opened up, guys, here and it's in Wexford now and they're coming to Cranberry. It's called Clean Juice. I also know they're very big in the South. And um, I'll tell you what, I am just so excited. This is like life changing for me um, because even though there's places around here that do smoothies and bowls and clean juice does that too, and they do it very well, but they also, they have, you know, juices that you can purchase right there at the counter that they do in a slow juicer, just like I have at home. Um, but they don't have a very long shelf life. You have to pretty much drink those right away, but they also have this amazing cold press machine, which I got like the whole tour of the back kitchen and got to see it in action and, 
I don't know, someday I might just go and juice all day and that'll be my job. It sounds like kind of a dream sometimes. Um, but just the smell in there of all this fresh produce and this cold press um, gives these juices a little bit more of a shelf life. Um, just a few days, but it makes a difference. And talk about convenience. I mean, there is a place now that's going to juice for you. Oh, again, it just made my day. So um, if you <laughs> do follow me on social media, you will see I'm in love with this place. I'm in love with the decor. It's all like black and white, which just side note is totally on brand with my company, which is all black and white. And I just love the simplicity and um, it's all organic. Everything they have there is organic because you know, when you're getting into five to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables a day, and especially when it comes to juicing and smoothies, when you're, you're consuming, you know, so many fruits and vegetables, if you're, if you're doing conventional, that's also a lot of pesticides and chemicals that you're consuming. So the fact that this place is all organic, oh my goodness, I just, I can't say enough about it. So really super exciting. And, and I guess, um, because I've been so excited about them mm -hmm. <laughs> and because of my platform as a health coach, um, they have asked me, they prevented me, presented me with official paper, paperwork to become a juice booster, which is really fun. Um, and they gave me like seriously a whole new wardrobe. So uh -huh. <laughs> every day I have a clean juice shirt or hat on. So uh -huh. anyway, loving, loving this place. And they've only been here about a month. Um, so I really look forward to, you know, lots of fun stuff in the future with them. So now that we've kind of gone through a couple tips and tricks on getting veggies and fruits into your day, let's spend a minute on meal time because this is the struggle, right? I mean, we've got kids to run around, we've got busy lives. You know, what can we do here to to eat a dinner at home and have a healthy meal? Because let's face it, like it's it's kind of paralyzing when you're trying to make these magazine and Pinterest worthy meals. And a lot of us think that's what healthy eating is because that's what the media shows, you know, and, and you just think, you know, I don't have time to shop for all those ingredients and wash all those pans. That's a whole nother thing, too. Like sometimes when you're making these extravagant meals, you know, there's so much cleanup work afterwards that the whole thing's so daunting that you just throw in the towel and go through the drive through you know, um, because it's just all too much. So again, my focus is always trying to get my clients back in their kitchen and just giving them some quick, easy, kid-friendly, that is so important, ways to do that. And, and the biggest thing for me is focusing on the quality of the ingredients, which is what Kim, you know, the first half of this podcast spent time talking about, because that's, that's what is important here. It's not even about what you're making, really. It doesn't have to be so beautiful. <laughs> it just needs to be made from high quality ingredients. So just to give you an example of um, some meal ideas that I give to my clients, I have and, and follow myself as well and have for years as I was working in corporate America and running kids around at night. And I probably had about 30 minutes to turn a meal around. So, you know, I had to get creative and it was always important for me to, you know, to be feeding my kids healthy food. So themed nights is what I've come up with. So you've got your taco night, you've got your pizza night, you've got your pasta night. And I'm sure you're all thinking, Lori, that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. But it comes down to the ingredients that you're using for these. So let me give you an example. Taco night would be like your grass-fed beef. It becomes all about the toppings, okay? And you just throw them out on that counter and let the kids do it. It's like the make-your-own taco. So maybe you put the meat on for them, especially if you have little kids and you don't want them by the stove. But you know, you give them, you put out the colorful peppers and the avocado and the tomato and onion and lettuce and even a little plain Greek yogurt, little side note there, um, instead of sour cream can add a little extra nutrition to, to your dinner. Um, but, you know, put all these toppings out for your family and let them make their own. And the other thing I've switched to and, and recommend is, um, you know, to season your tacos. A lot of those packages of seasoning that we're buying have so much sodium in them. So, you know, I got to tell you, my family didn't really even notice. And I've heard this from clients, too, just switching to pure spices that you have, like your chili powder and your cumin and maybe even a little bit of garlic and 
um, you know, onion and that kind of stuff to season your meat instead of, you know, some of those powders that you're, that we typically are buying in the store. And this can save you some money too. So there are like when you're, when you're getting to the basics, there are little ways that you can find savings too to make up for some of these things that you're having to spend a little bit more money on. Now, can I just say something uh-huh. more? Um, I, there's a, like a crock pot kind of taco uh, meal that I make. I make it with um, sh- uh, chicken, mm-hmm. but yeah, it does call the actual recipe calls for a pack, a package of like the taco seasoning but they do have MSG, and also a lot of them are not gluten-free either. Um, you can find gluten, gluten-free, gluten but what I do, like Lori said, is I combine spices, um, like sh- the ones that she mentioned, the cumin and um, the garlic powder and X, Y, and Z, and I put them, and I make them, I make it once, and I put it, I, and I use up a lot of it, but then I keep that mm-hmm. um, at, in a glass jar, and then I can use it over and over and over again. So you make it once, and then you have it, you know, for many meals after that. And think of all that sodium you just saved your family from consuming. So yeah, just a little um, switch of a few things on your taco night. And something else that I do since I'm into the theme nights, um, you know, on this meal idea is taco night once a week. Okay. So Maybe you think that's boring, you know, Taco Tuesday. But the way to add some variety with that is, you know, one week, like Kim said, use chicken for your tacos. One week, grass-fed beef. One week, maybe a little ground turkey, you know, um, fish tacos. Like, just get get creative with the different meats that you're using. And then you can get creative with the bases, too. You can switch that up every week, too. So taco night is, like, your toppings can kind of stay consistent, but switch up, you know, um, you can do chips. Like we were talking about your non-GMO tortilla chips. You can you make it, like, nacho style or, you know, get some whole grain wraps and, and do, you know, soft tacos. And so and taco salads, like, get some salad, and that's, your, you know, put all your tacos, meat, and toppings on top of a bed of lettuce. So your taco night can look different every week to give you a variety. Um, but again, it always comes back to focusing on the quality of those ingredients. Another night I love for families is pizza night which, okay, we picture we're calling up Domino's or whatever, and they're bringing this greasy, nasty um, pizza, which I like pizza sometimes, so don't get me wrong. <laughs> we all like our, our splurges now and then. But, I mean, if you're doing this a couple times a week, it, you know, it's, you're, not getting, you're not getting all that high nutrition into your kids. So pizza night can be fun because if you use, like, little um, – multigrain pitas as your base, okay? And then you do all these toppings, like maybe these pre-chopped vegetables that you got that you're using in your stir fry or a pasta sauce and all these different um, things that you can start adding more vegetables to. If you um, put them all out again on pizza night and, and with the pitas, it's kind of like make your own again, which kids find this stuff really fun. And you put all the vegetable toppings out. You can do just like an olive oil garlic base um, or like a nice organic pizza sauce is is actually not that hard to find. Um, And then some organic shredded mozzarella. And this goes back to like a shredded Mexican cheese for your tacos. You know, if you if you do eat dairy and you eat cheese, like even our local Walmart now is selling organic shredded cheese. So it's it's becoming a lot easier to find. And the organic um, versions like the great value at Walmart, those prices are not bad. So it's very encouraging to see a lot of this coming more mainstream and not having to run to Whole Foods or somewhere like that every time, you know, you need something. So I love to see that. But, you know, just those are just a couple ideas of taco night and pizza night to involve the kids and incorporate more veggies. And, you know, maybe they just put one mushroom or one green pepper on that pizza. But you know what? It's progress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, try to not get too hung up on that. It's like this constant exposure that um, because I know the little kids, it's just there. That's probably the most challenging part. But but I can tell you as a mother of teens at this point, just keep at it because they will come around, even though it doesn't seem like they ever will. (laughs) They will just keep exposing them to it. Um, You know, and then one other night a week 
maybe you want to experiment with a new recipe because it's fun. It's not fun making a new recipe every night. It's a lot of work, but maybe once a week or on the weekends, you know, it's just something fun to do or, or experiment with a plant-based meal or something like that. Um, but experimentation can be really fun, but it can also be very paralyzing. So that's why it's nice to have like a set themed night for your week. And then, you know, you can play around with some of the other days with uh, even just like four or five planned meals that you don't even have to give much thought to. Again, your pizza, your taco, like all these simple, simple things. And then on the weekend, you do something fun or, you know, you work in like a crock pot meal one, uh, another night and maybe you do get takeout one night. I mean, they have these awesome apps now you can order from anywhere and they bring it right to your door. So, I mean, that you can take advantage of these things. Um, you just don't want to get to the place where you're taking advantage of them the majority of your week, you know? Um, so hopefully these are some, some quick tips. I do dive much deeper with my clients into meals. That's, you know, a lot of moms that I work with that is like, that's a huge, it's a huge topic and it's a huge concern. It's a huge struggle for many people. So this just gives you a little taste of it, but I also want to just touch real quickly on kids, you know, about, we were just saying making it friendly or making it fun for them. And, you know, if we're too restrictive with them too, I think a lot of times it can backfire. So I think that the whole thing with kids, and we're never going to solve the age old issue of, you know, making them eat their fruits and vegetables, but maybe if we take the word making them out and just, you know, provide a really good role model for yourself, talking about how much you're enjoying all your colorful vegetables that you're eating and they see you doing it and you're putting it out every day, making it available to them and just that constant exposure, you know, I think, I think you will get there and it might only be one little mushroom or green pepper that they're adding, but it's progress. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we've covered a lot today and we hope it was beneficial to you. I know I just learned a lot from Lori. She has the best tips. Um, and we're going to hear more about, um, you know, her abilities and her offerings as a health coach next week. But for now, for more from Lori, you can go to simplyempoweredllc.com. For more from Kim, you can go to kimmarovich.com. We're always open to listener questions or suggestions for the show. And you can email those to contact at a whole new you podcast.com. We'd also love it if you joined our Facebook community and followed us on Instagram. Just search for a whole new you podcast. And lastly, if you'd be so kind as to leave us a review in iTunes and also subscribe to the podcast, we'd really appreciate it so more people can find our show and join our community. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.